from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi everyone, my name is Nicholas Brown and I'm a music specialist and concert producer here at the Library of Congress. It's my great pleasure to present to you Pontus Lidberg, who is an acclaimed Swedish choreographer. Uh, the Library of Congress and Martha Graham Dance Company have co-commissioned Pontus's new creation, Woodland, which is a dance for the Martha Graham Dance Company. And Woodland is set to music by American composer Irving Fine. So Pontus, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Great. Um, so, can you tell us a little bit about your background? When did you start dancing and do you have any training in music or mm. other forms of art? Yes, uh, I came from a family that was very interested in the arts in general. My mother more so in the performing arts and my father more perhaps in literature and architecture. Uh, but I was exposed to everything and then one day uh, my parents took me, I was four years old, to a ballet performance and I said that, that I wanted to do that. And uh, obviously, at four years old, you don't know anything. But I had some intuitive sense that I wanted to dance. And so I did. And I actually never stopped. It just kind of uh, fed into uh, uh, my education at the Royal Swedish Ballet School that started at 10. And then I, uh, after nine years, I started working. So you know, I've, it's been a, a, a continuous journey from four years mm -hmm. old. But I also played the piano. I have a training in piano. and. Around the age of 10, I had to make a choice if I was going to pursue uh, music or dance. And actually, that was not so easy. Mm -hmm. It was more chance that made one, uh, you know, th that, let me say that again. Um, it was more by chance that I chose dance. It had to do with uh, the audition for the Academy of Music was on a s Sunday. It was dark in the winter. Mm -hmm. I was alone with a with a teacher or something in a room singing and playing. And the audition for the Royal Swedish Ballet School was on a Thursday and there was lots of people and very dynamic and people in the corridors and it seemed like an exciting place. I, honestly, as I remembered it, mm -hmm. it was more because of that that Maybe. I chose dance. That's interesting. Um, and with your dance studies, did you go beyond the Royal Swedish Ballet? I know you've had some training in Martha Graham. Was that at mm -hmm. the Royal Swedish Ballet? Yes. So the first contemporary dance training that I had at the Royal Swedish Ballet School, which was a classical ballet training, but to expose all the students to contemporary dance, there were, there were various forms of contemporary training as well. And the first one was Graham Technique. Mm -hmm. But that was a long time ago. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and what other contemporary techniques did you study? And w then, then I w was exposed to many others. And I, it's interesting because in classical ballet, there are, of course, styles of training. But I mean, in essence, it's, it's the same thing. But in contemporary dance, it's not really the case. M Martha was one of the few who really codified a technique. And then others have, have done it too. But it's kind of m more following the style and ideas of a person as opposed to a technique that mm. is universally accepted. And so we had release technique and we had uh, other kinds of training, but it's not really comparable, I think, to classical technique training. Mm -hmm. um, and is there any specific production or memory from, say, your teenage years and your dance training that really formed who you are today as an artist? Hmm. Or any specific teacher that you worked with? Um, what comes to mind, and I guess in intuition, you know, what I, what comes to mind is actually some of the travels I did uh, in the summer. So at the age of 13 onwards, more or less, every summer there would be some training uh, uh, travel because of course, the, the layoff period in the school year was more than two months, and that's too long not to train. So I started going to ballet seminars or camps or guest studies at different schools internationally. And some of those were eye-openers to me because when you're part of a small context in Stockholm at the Royal Swedish Ballet School, it's very small. You know, there's, you have your 
you know, seven co-students and you have your teachers and every day is the same and it's very uh, formalized and rigid and that's what you do. And then you go out, out into the world and there are different kinds of styles and emphasis and training in students and that was eye-opening for me. And a, there were many, actually. One in particular is I spent one summer semester at the National Ballet School of Canada in Toronto. And that was really an eye-opener because I felt like I saw different aspects of my dancing and other people saw that and reflected it back to me. Mm -hmm. And um, that was very important. Okay. At what point did you start choreographing? I started as soon as I had an opportunity, to mm -hmm. be honest. Even I was, I suppose, 11 or something. Because there were, there were school concerts throughout the year, and there was one in particular before Christmas where students were given the opportunity to create or to perform a solo. It was a little bit more informal maybe than the other concerts, and uh, I started creating for that. So um, I would say as soon as there was an opportunity to choreograph, I would take it mm -hmm. in school. And then as a dancer, it became clear pretty quickly that actually creating dance was more aligned with what I wanted from the art form. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I like performing, but what is necessary is to be creative. Mm -hmm. And with your choreography, do you approach uh, working with ensembles differently than with soloists or pairs? Yes. Oh, it's so different. Um, a recent work had 45 dancers in it wow. and, uh, and, and other, other pieces. Actually, I prefer to do intimate pieces because I think that my, one of my strengths is to draw out things from individuals and you can't do that with huge groups. You kind of have to step back and look at the overall picture and it's almost more like organizing and so I, I, I mean, I, I like doing both, but I do prefer working intimately with people mm -hmm. because it's just more rewarding. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you f find there's a difference in the way you choreograph when it's an independent project that you're doing with your, uh, under the umbrella of Pontus Lidberg Dance versus working with an established company that has a very um, set profile at mm -hmm. least to the public? Yeah, I, I, I'm adaptable in that way and I like, I like to meet contexts that inform me because mm -hmm. it's a dialogue. So I, I'm not the kind of choreographer that arrives and imposes something regardless of where I am, mm -hmm. but rather I like to first have a feel for what kind of, what kind of dancers and people am I working with and what does that reflect you know, in my work and what can we do together. Mm -hmm. Basically, as a young choreographer, I was more interested in creating my own steps, my own choreography, my own sequences and so on, and I did that. But after a while, I thought that, I started to understand that in fact, there is, I, there is more to, to find when you start collaborating with people, and it, it, I, I like the conversational aspect of creating, mm -hmm. so I prefer that now. And uh, of, of course, some companies do have a very strong identity, like this one, mm -hmm. for example. And uh, that's very nice for me because it means that I get information that I wouldn't be able to, to have otherwise. It's, uh, it enriches me and then from that information I give back, you know, so I, I, it's, it's really conversational. I will give an impetus to something and then the dancers will reflect back to me and then I take that and guide it onwards. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we think about the Woodland project mm -hmm. specifically, what was your process of selecting the piece that mm -hmm. you wanted to work mm -hmm. with? And then also, how has the work evolved from the, the very first conceptual meetings mm -hmm. or, or sessions where you were thinking through things versus the, the first rehearsals to mm -hmm. now? Um, well, so first I started listening to, to um, a music selection and uh, just getting familiar with with this composer and what, by the way, who, whose music is rather varied. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I, it, it took a little bit of searching because initially I was considering working conceptually, which is something I sometimes do, meaning 
I will have an idea and then I will find the elements that all work together to make this idea uh, visible or to, to uh, work together to uh, create uh, this work. But I found that Irving Fine's music, and especially the piece that I ended up choosing, I actually chose another piece first. The, f the first one that I chose was Serious Song mm -hmm. for Strings, and I was sure that that was going to be there, because I was like, this is wonderful, mm -hmm. and this needs to be choreographed. But I found it very difficult to pair something with it. Mm -hmm. And it was like standalone and too short as such, and yeah, so, so I changed my mind. But the more I worked with the music, the more I kind of understood that actually superimposing a concept on this is not going to work out very well. No. I have to change my um, point of entry and work with the music and just kind of listen to what it's saying. Uh, which is something I also do sometimes. It's yeah. not new for me at all, but it's just a different kind of uh, entry to the piece. So that's what I started doing. I was just writing down little things I heard in the music uh, freely um, and uh, like gathering material that way. At the same time, I started rehearsing with uh, dancers or started yeah. to, cr to create. And that was the first time I had worked with these dancers. And uh, as I mentioned, they are particular. They have a style. They have a uh, kind of uh, an expression that is practiced. Mm -hmm. So I started just throwing material at them to see what they would reflect back. And we would, we tried uh, then uh, do, uh, rehearsing that material with the music and see how that how that uh, uh, worked together. Um, so. In the beginning, I was very open, like to just see what my material, these dancers, and this music. What would that? What what is that? And then I started to kind of like more specifically tease out what the piece would be. But I stayed with the with the basic, the fundamental idea for the piece is that I have created something to the music. It's really the music that informed the piece. What specifically about Fine's music, like whether it's rhythm or mm -hmm. harmonies, um, really lends itself to being set to dance? Well, one of the challenges that I found, and which I hope that I have delivered, we'll see, I suppose, <laughs> tonight, um, is that I, as I heard, the request was to work with the music of Irving Fine, who is no longer alive but to create a contemporary work with his music. So that's m meaning taking mid-century music, mm -hmm. essentially, and creating a t contemporary work. And uh, I, that, that is not super easy. No, I bet. <laughs> yeah, because his music is particular. Mm -hmm. I, in my ears, especially in the, at first, you know, the first time you hear it, um, I was like, this is American mid-century music. Yeah. So that's, it's very specific, and so, um, for, I also considered visually, I was like, should I maybe go there? Should I create something mid-century? But uh, which I did not end up doing. Um, but I think his music is very sophisticated. It has a lot of detail. It uh, has a lot of interesting kind of turns. It's not uh, like a lot of music nowadays that choreographers like to use me included sometimes, not always, is more like uh, a landscape that continues for a long time. Um, I would say, like, Philip Glass is a good example that a lot of people know. I mean, it continues similarly for a long time. It changes a little bit, but mm -hmm. it's more like a you know, highway or something. Yeah. Uh, whereas Irving Fine's music is not that. There is an idea that lasts for seven seconds, and then it goes somewhere else. You know, it's very rich mm -hmm. in that way. So that's something I had to also adapt to. There's like split second moments that then dissolve into the next thing. But that's also f fun and interesting to do choreographically. So I, I kind of, I've uh, created in, in that way. It's not uh, very long sequences of things that go on for a long time, but rather they, they change quickly. Um, it's very beautiful. It's a. Uh, it. Ha I mean, it's very. It has very beautiful melody mm -hmm. and very beautiful harmony. 
so, I mean, that's always wonderful for dance. It, it, I, as I see dance, is a, dance is really a synergy of many art forms because it's the visual aspects, it's the movement aspect, it's the, uh, what you hear. It's um, also can be theater, what mm -hmm. you're narrating if that's happening. There's a lot of things going on. So, of course, the music being beautiful is, is uh, very nice. Yes. <laughs> um, how did you arrive at the title of Woodland? And is there some kind mm -hmm. of narrative that you've mm -hmm. come to associate with the piece? Um, yeah, it, it, it's a title that shouldn't be taken too literally because it's not about anything, really. But uh, again, as I was creating this and I as I was watching my own rehearsals, one of the things that I see in the piece is that it's a little bit like watching nature or being in the forest and watching, just sitting down still and watching what's unfolding around you. And for example, and this is not literal, but for example, there's a fox walks through the woods or a bird arrives, it sits on a branch for a little while and then flies away. And it doesn't mean anything, and yet it can be very meaningful actually, just to watch these things, watch these things unfold. So the idea of a forest was like, uh, one of the first words that I came up with. But then woodland is also an adjective of the woods. Mm -hmm. So I, that's how I chose the, the title. The other th connotation is being lost in the woods. There's kind of an air of young adults or children, not literally children, but being lost in the woods and finding their way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. Um, and how would you say the process was like working with the designers to, to realize the costumes and to sort of bring the vision mm -hmm. of the you know, multiple aspects together? So they came in later in the process, which w w when there was already quite a lot of material and these ideas were already there. So they, they uh, designed things that are inspired by both children and animals and young adults, all mm. of it together. And um, yeah, so, so that, that happened later in the process. Mm. And what is it like to be paired with Copeland mm. and, and the, the barber and the Chavez on this program? Well, it's a tall order. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, uh, I, one always tries to make the m best and uh, most thoughtful work possible in any given circumstance. And uh, my, what I appreciate most from this creation has been working with the dancers because they have been very generous mm -hmm. and uh, like they have contributed a lot to this. So that's something I very much appreciate. Obviously, I think part of the Part of the challenge for me being given a composer to work with who is, I can talk to mm -hmm. means that I have, I'm actually given par like a set work, you know. I, ha I could choose to work, but nevertheless, it's a work that already exists. Yes. And that, those, that framework is already there, which is different to coming up with a concept or a story or a theme or a like from the beginning and then have the music and the dance kind of be created towards the same goal. Mm -hmm. So basically I, um, yeah, it's a different kind of piece than Appalachian Spring, for example. Sure. You know, it can't be compared. It's a different, it, the, the way of it coming about is very different. It's a, um, yeah. Do you know the story of how the title came to be for, for Appalachian Spring? No. So um, Copeland just wrote it as Ballet for Martha. Uh -huh. and he didn't have the associations with all of the sort of American folk culture that we right. have now. Right. Um, and Martha, at a certain point, um, associated the music with this poem by Hart Crane, mm -hmm. and where it says Appalachian Spring in there as, as one of the lines. Um, and she hadn't even titled it until very, very late. And um, mm -hmm. the chief of the music division at the time had been writing to her through Eric Hawkins because mm -hmm. she wasn't responding to letters saying, we need a title more than Ballet for Martha for the press release for the right. performance, which mm -hmm. was within three, four weeks already at that wow. point. And 
it became this thing that is so nationalistic and populist. Yes. Um, when that was not the intention at all, which is right. kind of interesting. Yeah. Well, that says something about Martha, I suppose, also, because. I mean, one never knows, you know, like looking back, you can see what, what things meant, you know. In the, but I mean, she was, she was creating history uh, for, for a while. Mm -hmm. But at some point, I'm sure that nobody knew that that was happening. Yeah. And it almost didn't happen. They, yeah. they had delays from 1942 is when they first mm -hmm. started talking about the project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Martha was late to get the original scenario to Copeland, mm -hmm. and Copeland was doing a film score, so he couldn't work on it. And then right. they had to decide the second composer, who was eventually Chavez. Right. And Chavez was incommunicado most of the time, wouldn't send anything back, didn't meet his deadlines. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to originally be in 1943, the premiere, then it got pushed to the fall of 43, spring of 44, and then finally the fall of 44, which is crazy. Wow. Really interesting. I'm yes. glad we didn't have those delays with your yeah, project. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you foresee Woodland having more performances beyond this initial run with the Graham Company? Will you ever mount it in, in Sweden, for example, or in Europe? Well, sure. I mean, um, I hope that the company will continue to mm -hmm. perform it. I mean, they will already uh, in New York coming up mm -hmm. in a few weeks. Um, I, I don't know. You know, part of creating is that you become rather myopic close to the premiere. And sometimes only like a year later can you watch it mm -hmm. and actually be objective about it. Yeah. And you know, of course you try very hard to be objective and, and you are working with it all the time. Um, but sometimes you can't really because it's too close. Mm -hmm. So I have reconsidered some of my works in both directions later, meaning sometimes I've appreciated them more later and, and other times I've felt like, oh, actually this needs to be adjusted. Um, but that, that needs to take a while before I can kind mm -hmm. of l look at it objectively, I think. Um, yeah. What is the experience of having the dance performed with live orchestra versus a recording? And are the differences most pronounced in a music like art music, mm -hmm. or would it matter with live electronic music versus having it, you know, recording it? Right. Music? Well, well, yeah, of course. I mean, it's a huge difference. And I mean, I made I, I made a piece uh, to the music of uh, to an original score by Max Richter in in Dresden, which was part electronic. So there was an electronic backtrack. There was also strings and piano, mm -hmm. and they had you know um, like they had kind of a click track, I think, too. Mm -hmm. To be able to match it with uh, electronics, and which was not so easy actually, okay. um, but I think w this is a really good question because you know a r recorded music is is can be it can work against you because you start to listen for and choreograph to the recording, mm -hmm. not the music like all sorts of personal choices that were made during that recording, uh -huh. you start taking for granted, like as if that is what it is. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as you know, when you're playing something yourself, like you can play something very differently. Your interpretation doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just like the way that you hear it is very different. The way I play piano is like, and certain pieces is different, you know, like the way I hear it, what I want to bring out. So. It's always interesting when you meet the orchestra and you uh, for the first time because sometimes it's like, oh, I missed that, you oh, know, really? like, yeah, because maybe you choreograph something to something that was actually just an artistic choice in the yeah. recording. But other, the opposite is also true. Sometimes you're like, oh, yeah, this is this is much, much better, you mm -hmm. know, or like, yeah, so it both can happen. But I I have a friend who is a conductor. He, use, he, he likes to say that, oh, like he doesn't like to conduct for dance because he says there are only two tempos in dance, mm. too fast or too slow. Oh, <laughs> uh, I mean, and he's being funny about it. But it's true that it's sensitive because, yeah. you know, what, you, what, what, what a musician does with, with their fingers or, you know, small movements to create sound can sometimes be huge movements that are precisely timed for a dancer with their whole body. And if you change the tempo one way or the other, it can just make or break. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is very sensitive, actually. 
But uh, of course, having said that, I much prefer having live music mm -hmm. to recorded music, much. Great. Do you prefer working with a certain genre of music, or do you enjoy working with jazz, classical, electronics, mm. all equally? Equally, yeah. I would say. Having said that, I think I just, you know, there, <laughs> I have my own universe that I'm drawn to and mm -hmm. that I like. And even within different genres, there's a certain kind of music that I, that speaks to me. Um, and there are definitely gaps in music that I don't really know much about, like uh, hip hop or uh. there, there, there are genres of music that I don't really know much about. But um, I do like working with living composers because it, it, because you can create something together from uh -huh. scratch. That that's very rewarding. Sometimes sometimes it you know it also means you don't know what it's going to be. So <laughs> so it's a um, it's a, it's a gamble. Mm -hmm. mm. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got involved in uh, your filmmaking mm -hmm. career? Um, I. As I grew up, uh, as a teenager, I was very interested in photography, and I had a had an analog camera. I was, you know, kind of dedicated in, to in taking f photographs, and I also uh, I I did darkroom myself as well. And uh, what that really meant was that I trained myself to look at things through the eyes of a through the lens, really, of the camera and composition in images and, and uh, like telling stories through images. Mm -hmm. So it made sense when I started choreographing that I would also work with film because that's kind of a combination of the two, really. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that for me, because I'm interested in so many different aspects of creating, not just movement or theater, or music, but or images, but all of them. Film is a medium that really gives you uh, the opportunity to work with a lot of different layers. Mm -hmm. So it's very satisfying, I think. Um, having said that, it's very time-consuming, expensive. At least the kind of productions that I that I uh, push to do, and so there, I I get to do many more stage works. Uh, per year mm -hmm. than film. Yeah, my, my film work tends to take a few years. Each, each project takes four or five years. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Um, when you choreograph, um, do you choreograph differently for film versus for the stage? Yes. Um, well, the biggest difference is that with a camera, I direct the eye of the audience. I can zoom in on some button here, you know, mm -hmm. if that's what I want the audience to see in a film. And that is all they will see because I decided so. But on a stage, you kind of put everything out there and it's up to each individual audience member to choose what they see or be drawn to something. I mean, you can't control that. Mm -hmm. So it's very different, actually. Uh, what do you think of this notion that the United States Congress promotes dance and new music and new commissions and choreography, because I think uh, working for them, I, and I know they get a lot of flack, but uh, sometimes there are good things that happen yeah. uh, here that are unexpected, I think. Yes. Well, I, I am honored, and uh, I mean, it's very exciting for me to be here and to also know that these seminal works were created in this place by the same yeah. um, organizations, and I'm, I mean, it, it's humbling, I have to say, and uh, uh, yeah, really humbling because um, it's feel, I feel it's difficult for me to live up to cer certain things that have been commissioned here. Uh, but uh, it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, we're so happy to have you here for sure. Um, I think as we're, we're starting to wrap up now, mm -hmm. um, I'd love to know what you think about the Graham Company's reputation, or not necessarily their reputation, but how they are perceived in the dance community outside mm -hmm. of the United States versus mm -hmm. within the United States? Mm -hmm. Or is there a difference? Um, I can only speak to what I know, and uh, 
it's been also interesting and important for me actually to work with the Graham company because um, Martha Graham really changed the landscape of dance, especially in America, but all over the world. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I started to see things that I didn't know where they were from. And in choreo choreographers like Pina Bausch, for example, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that came from Martha. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in Sweden, you can see the lineage of Birgit Kohlberg and Mats Ek. You can also see, oh, that came from Martha. And uh, so I think that her company, this company, is perhaps not as alive, you know, it's not on people's minds immediately in Europe as much as it is here. Though the name obviously is instantly recognizable mm -hmm. and people know exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. But um, I have started to appreciate that in fact, she's very much alive in many people yeah. who might not even know it. Fascinating. Mm. What is next for you? After this project, I have a premiere at Sadler's Wells Theatre in London, mm -hmm. uh, April twentieth, for a, a company in London called Ballet Boys. Oh Con yes, they're wonderful. Yeah. Contemporary dance company. Great. And do you foresee working with the Graham Company again in the future? I, uh, I certainly wish. Great. Yeah. That that will happen. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, what has it been like to to work with Janet? Because she's she, you know, in in terms of her vision for the company mm -hmm. and. Um, her supporting uh, other choreographers? Mm -hmm. Well, I think she's doing exactly what is necessary. Martha Graham, the Martha Graham lineage and the heritage, they already have, and that's there and needs to be maintained and cultivated and, and uh, is very important. But for a company to be alive, it also needs new work, mm -hmm. I think. You cannot only... I mean, it's the difference between being exclusively a museum or a, 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 li a living company. Sure. So I think, I mean, she's spot on. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to answer some questions. And uh, thank you. we'll look forward to seeing the premiere of Woodland this evening. And uh, encourage you to come back and visit us anytime. And thank encourage you. Uh, our viewers to uh, visit loc.gov. And if you search for Pontus's name, Pontus Lidberg, or Woodland, or Irving Fine, or Martha Graham, you will find a load of resources through which you can learn more about the legacy of the Martha Graham Dance Company at the Library of Congress. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.